Shamima Begin, who was 15 when she left the UK to join Islamic State, has had her bid to overturn that decision to strip her of her British citizenship. That's failed. So she can't return to the UK. It, what do you make of that decision? Well, look, I welcome the court's decision, uh, but you'll understand I can't uh, comment more because there are legal considerations ongoing. I just welcome the fact that the government has uh, and always will take all actions necessary to defend the British people. So you welcome the decision? You think it was the right decision? Look, I welcome the decision. I'm afraid for legal considerations. I can't say any more. How close is a Brexit deal? Well, the talks are ongoing. They're positive. Ursula von der Leyen and the Prime Minister have both said that they are positive. And the Prime Minister has been in Northern Ireland recently and has been speaking uh, to colleagues across Parliament uh, in recent days as well, because this is a decision not just for Northern Ireland, but for the whole of the United Kingdom. It's not going to happen, is it? I'm very confident the Prime Minister will get the best deal possible for the country. And that's exactly what he wants. That's, by the way, also what the Taoiseach wants in Dublin. It's also what uh, the President of the European Commission wants in Brussels. I guess the issue is it's not just about getting the best deal or what the Prime Minister thinks is the best deal. I can't comment on that, right, because I haven't seen the deal. I don't know how good it is or not. But it's about politics as well, isn't it? And what's become abundantly clear is that the PM hasn't squared off the people he needs to in order to get this Brexit deal through, the DUP, the Eurosceptics and your own party. Well, look, I think this is part of the negotiation, right? I mean, because the negotiation with the European Union is about making sure that we get the best deal uh, with the European Union and that we get the best partnership with the Republic of Ireland going forward. And yes, of course, it means listening to all voices across the United Kingdom, but it means listening to all voices in the Conservative Party, of course it does, but across the United Kingdom means also uh, the communities in Northern Ireland. And that's why the Prime Minister has invested so much time, so much effort, talking to our partners, not just in the DUP, but in the Ulster Unionists and the other parties in Northern Ireland. It doesn't look like it's paying off, though. The DUP, they are absolutely critical, as you and I both know, and our viewers know as well, to getting a Brexit deal across the line. I just want to play you what Geoffrey Daunton of the DUP said at Prime Minister's Questions today. Let's listen. And will he assure me that he will address these fundamental constitutional issues and do so not just by tweaking the protocol, but by rewriting the legally binding treaty text? Yeah. Rewriting the legally binding treaty text. It's not going to happen, is it? Well, look, the Prime Minister's answer to that question was very interesting because he was ex entirely complimentary of Geoffrey. And Geoffrey has been somebody who many of us have worked with for a long time. In fact, I was in the army with Geoffrey's brother. They've been friends for a very, very long time. This is a very important negotiation. It's a very, very important deal. And for those of us who are absolutely passionate, Conservatives, of course, yes, but Unionists as well, recognising that the whole of the United Kingdom needs to be kept whole and integral in the single market, in the internal market of the United Kingdom, recognising the the, 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 both communities and protecting the Good Friday Agreement. On the specifics of what Geoffrey Daunton is saying, right? And, and I get that the tone is very measured, but you have to listen to the substance, not the tone. And the tone, he is saying, is he wants it rewritten, the text rewritten, and that's not what the EU is going to do. Well, what he wants is he wants an agreement that keeps the internal market of the United Kingdom... He was Kingdom very together. specific about what he wanted. He wants <laughs> to be reopened. He wants the internal market of the United Kingdom held together. Of course he does. He's, and so do I, by the way. He wants to make sure that the United Kingdom is whole and integral. And of course, so do I. But he also wants to get over... Uh, the difficulties that the protocol has been causing at the moment. And he's not alone in that. Other parties in Northern Ireland, other parties in the Republic of Ireland and other parties in the European Union have also spoken about resolving the difficulties. So I think this is a really good start for a positive uh, series of conversations. No, we're not at a deal yet, that's true. But that's exactly what we're working towards. And to have Ursula von der Leyen and the Prime Minister saying positive things... I think that's a good start. Well, yeah, you've got the EU and the Prime Minister saying positive things, but the problem is the people back home who need to vote for the deal. The DUP have got serious red lines and it looks very hard to clear. And, of course, people in your own party as well, the Eurosceptics, too, have been expressing a concern about the deal. It does feel like, you know, anyone could have predicted that this was going to happen. Anyone paying any attention to the last five years of Westminster could have predicted this was going to happen. Sophie, it's, it's certainly true that nobody is going to be surprised that there is a lot of discussion about it. That's, you know... Discussion's one way of putting it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's how discussions work. I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussion about it. That's absolutely right. And the Prime Minister is in, in the process of having those discussions. Now, what we've got to do is get to a, a, a position that works for both communities in Northern Ireland. That's absolutely essential. And that maintains those, th those essential points. It maintains... Uh, it protects the Good Friday Agreement, it keeps the internal market of the United Kingdom uh, solid and, 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 and open, 
And of course, it resolves the difficulty that so many different people are talking about today. You don't have to be Jeffrey Donaldson. You can, you can be Doug Beattie, who leads the Ulster Unionists, and indeed other members of different parties in Northern Ireland, who are all talking about this need to resolve some of those problems. So that's not a, that's not a unionist position. It's not a nationalist position. There are, everybody's talking about it. I just wanted to listen to what uh, Steve Baker had to say to me. It was the weekend before Rishi Sunak effectively won the leadership contest. He was backing Rishi Sunak, but he did so with a very clear red line. Some would say, you know, he was almost laying down the law. Let's, let's have a listen to what he told me uh, there. This is what Steve Baker said. The current policy on the Northern Ireland Protocol must be continued. And I think this is another absolutely crucial point. If, if say, Rishi doesn't, or Penny, didn't carry through that policy, the Eurosceptics would implode the government. And, again, whatever anyone else may think, that my colleagues like friends like Bill Cash and Mark Francois and John Redwood, they are not going to tolerate any diversion, any equivocation on this point. He's right, isn't he? The Eurosceptics is about to implode the government. Steve is a great guy and a good friend and a man of very high integrity. And he is now, in the Northern Ireland office, part of these talks. So, frankly, if we can get... Does he support it? Steve's part of the talk. Steve's actually in the Northern Ireland office, part of these talks. So Steve will no doubt be making sure that his voice is heard and the voice of those people who, uh, like him, have been on the Eurosceptic wing of the party are heard. And that's really important. It's absolutely fantastic that we've got somebody like Steve making those points inside government so that when we come to having those discussions outside government with the rest of the party, as you quite rightly say, the voices have not just been heard at the end but actually right through the process. So I think it's very positive. Can you say for sure there will be a vote on this? Look, the Prime Minister has said today that Parliament will have its voice heard, and there are many different ways in which the Parliament can have its D voice Does that mean there will be a vote on any Brexit deal? You'll have to ask the Chief Whip about that. I'm afraid the Chief Whip's in charge of parliamentary business. But pa the Prime Minister has been extremely clear that the Parliament will have its, its voice heard. And in many ways, we're having our voice heard at the moment as discussions are being conducted, and we'll, we'll have to see what happens in the end. Doesn't sound like a yes to me. Well, you'll have to talk to the Chief Whip, I'm afraid. I don't decide but you said parliamentary the PM's business. Being, you said the PM's being clear. It can't He's, be that clear if you can't he, tell me. Well, it's very clear that the Parliament's having its voice heard. Is it? Yes. What, so will there be a vote? But Parliament has its voice heard at the moment. This is the, 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 the discussions that we're having. But that's the point, isn't it? If you say that Parliament's having its voice heard now, then it, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a vote, does it? <laughs> Sophie, I, I'm not going to tell you what the, what the votes are or are not going to be. OK, you campaign to remain, uh, of course, in the EU. Has Brexit been a success? This is a decision. The British people have taken a decision and what we've got to do is make sure that it works. And the challenge that we've got at the moment is to make sure that we resolve those issues in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, there are some very, very particular uh, issues. You know them. You've covered Northern Ireland for a lot longer uh, than, than I have in some ways. And, and it's absolutely essential that we focus on what those challenges are and we resolve them. Because the Good Friday Agreement that we're celebrating 25 years of this year was a remarkable achievement by some outstanding people who managed to get round the table and resolve a problem that had been ongoing for nearly 100 years. And to see uh, people like uh, Seamus Mallon and David Hume uh, and David Trimble getting round that table and actually making this peace process work, giving us 25 years of peace, not just in Northern Ireland, but in London and indeed in Kent, uh, where that deal bomb killed so many Royal Marines, reminds us why this isn't just about Northern Ireland, it's about the whole of the United Kingdom. Are you a bit worried about... Uh, you, you talk you know, very eloquently about you know, the Good Friday Agreement and about history in Northern Ireland. Are you, are you worried that it's at stake? No, I'm very positive that actually what we've got ourselves into is a situation where these discussions, these conversations, are being held peacefully by elected members, not by gunmen, not by uh, militias, but by elected members of various different parties uh, across our islands, and I think that's really important. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about Ukraine, if I may. Um, President Biden, the US president, uh, visited uh, Ukraine uh, recently. How significant a moment was that? Look, I think it's a very significant moment. I think it's, it's quite noticeable that uh, a US president has gone to a war zone. Um, I can't think of an occasion when a US president has done that other than to go and visit US troops. So it's uh, certainly not in recent... Uh, not in recent years. So I think it's, it's, it's pretty telling. And I think it speaks to the extraordinary courage of President Zelensky and to the importance of the Ukrainian people and to the, the fight that they are uh, conducting, because they really are quite literally on the front line of freedom. Uh, and we know absolutely that Putin's ambitions would not stop in Ukraine mm. 
uh, were he to be let through, and therefore what they're doing is they're defending us all. What do you mean by that, that his ambitions wouldn't stop in Ukraine? What, well, what does let's, that mean? let's just have a look at the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you go to 2007, for example, you see a very major cyber attack on Estonia in 2008. You see the invasion of Georgia uh, in 2000, and uh, I think it was 11 or 12, forgive me, I'm going to get it wrong, but a, a Ukraine, an Estonian border guard was kidnapped from the Estonian border and taken to Moscow and put on a trial. You see later incidents in Ukraine, where the, in 2014, of course, the uh, invasion and the capture of uh, Crimea, later attacks in Montenegro, attempted assassinations, attacks in the Czech Republic, and indeed here in the UK, uh, the use of a chemical and a nuclear substance to murder uh, individuals here in the United Kingdom. Now, those, uh, some of them weren't war, acts of war, but all of them were warlike acts. And here we are seeing a genuine act of war, a major element of state aggression, uh, the kind of which we haven't seen in 80 or so years. So you, you say that Ukraine is on the front line for freedom. And, of course, earlier this month, President Zelensky came here to the UK yeah. speaking to MPs. I think it was the second time he'd left the country since the uh, invasion. And he had one really clear message. He said that we need jets. Is he going to get them? Well, we've already started training Ukrainian pilots. And I have to say, I think that's an incredibly important thing to do, because what you don't want to do is make the decision, then find you've got six months to wait until you've trained the people uh, to operate the, machine, the, the equipment. So I think that's a really, really important decision. But let's not undersell what we're already doing. Since 2014, the United Kingdom has been training the, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces. We've been assisting with any number of different forms of uh, intelligence and, uh, sorry, cyber support in terms of the uh, cyber defence of Ukraine. And we've been making sure that the Ukrainian people are in the best possible situation. I don't think anyone would dispute what the UK has done to this point. Yeah. But the, the question is specifically about jets. And, and I honestly don't really know what the answer is. I can't work out if you're saying, yeah, it's on the table because, yes, we're definitely going to do it or actually we're just kicking it into the long grass. It's not going to happen. What, what, what is it? Are we going to so give jets? That's not a decision we're going to take right now. That's a decision that we're going to have to consider. But, of course, what we've already done, and this is why I think the Prime Minister's decision to begin training is so important, is we've already put the Ukrainians in a position where, were that decision on jets to change, they will be in a position to accept them. We have potentially um, opened the door to giving jets to uh, Ukraine. We're also sending 14 tanks, I think. Are we going to backfill them in our own army? Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to ask the Defence Secretary yeah. about that, and that's going to come up in the integrated okay. review, so I'm not going to preempt that. Sure. Me. And should there be more uh, money for defence uh, in the budget? £11 billion, pounds, that's what the Defence Secretary So, look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an ex-soldier. You're never going to hear me say no to that question. But, but the reality is there's a huge number of things we've got to balance uh, at the moment. This has been a really difficult time for the country. You don't need me to tell you that. You've been covering it uh, in great detail. Um, and what we've got to do is we've got to make sure we get a fair settlement for everybody in the United Kingdom, but also that we keep ourselves safe. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.